Hey everybody, welcome to the bottle line simulation exercise four, fill and cap the bottles. Uh, the last thing we did was work on the grinder and the boxes moving out down here. Now we're gonna move up top here. We're gonna use this filling machine. There's an extension that'll come down into each bottle. You're gonna fill it with a large amount or a small amount. And then this is a capper that goes down on top of each one of the bottles. So here are the instructions. There aren't many details that need to be explained about the filling operation. Energize the fill tube solenoid I'll put two six, I believe that's here. It's not gonna mouse over because I have this window up over here, but you'll see the fill tube is what shoots down into the bottles for the filling. Um, then you must make a choice of discharging a large or a small quantity based on the size of the bottle. Um, that's solenoid two seven and two eight. So you have to look at your Boolean variables or Boolean data and see if it's gonna be a large bottle or a small bottle. Um, the capping station controls should be a matter of capping each bottle as it comes along and they tell you that you don't have to determine whether or not there is a uh, um, large bottle or small bottle there just has to be a bottle there so if there's no bottle there because that was a spot where there was a scrap bottle it should have already been ground up and you don't want to keep shooting caps out where there's no bottle because they'll fill up on the assembly line um, so the filling section I kind of space these out and break it down filling section what I did was I used a one shot rising to a latched output for the filler extension so the one shot rising needs to receive needs to have been untrue before it in the previous run in the previous scan and then went true so it has to be on the rising edge so that's the reason I have this LS1 switch uh, over here for when the bottles exist because it just continuously strobes on off on off and off so even if these other two are true, this is gonna go false and then back true in between every single bottle. So that gives me a way to go from false to true for every single bottle based on the state of these other two Boolean data uh, variables here. Um, so these are basically making sure it's not a broken bottle. This is the filling section. So directly under this filler, if neither of neither the one that it's about to fill or the one um, that's coming up next, if neither of them are broken, it'll strobe when it passes this uh, LS1 limit switch. It'll fire by one shot and the filler will extend. So after it extends, this is a latching extension. So if any of these go off after that, so it only, this one shot only fires for one scan. So the next scan, like a millisecond later, if this was a normal extension or a normal uh, output, it would go off and the a filler wouldn't be extended anymore it would shoot back up and it would only be down for a split second like a microsecond um, or millisecond I should say and because this strobe's going to go off too in between the bottles but anyway the point is you want things based on um, actions not on times so I saw a lot of people that had timers if you look through my whole program I don't have a single timer I have um, I have some math here I have two count ups that's it Everything else is just basic bits and one shots um, and latching and unlatching contacts or outputs, OTEs as Alan Bradley calls them. Um, so you're going to fire, if everything's right, there's not a broken bottle here and there is a bottle in position, it's going to strobe, it's going to latch this extension so it's going to shoot out. Um, what's going to make it shoot back in? because uh, it's going to stay latched so after this everything else is going to this one shot's only going to fire for one scan so the next scan it's not going to be true the input side of this rung isn't going to be true anymore so it won't be providing um, a signal for this output to be on but because it's latched output it'll stay on until it eventually receives the unlatched signal so it doesn't need to be true on this side anymore after it gets the latch signal the only thing that'll turn it off is if it receives an unlatch and you'll see they're, they're addressed to the same uh, output address, which is the extension for the filler. Uh, the next rung I'm going to look at, I'm going to see, is there a large bottle at the filler? And if there is a large bottle, bottle that'll make this instruction true. And is the filler extended? So is this output high or true? So if the filler is extended and there is a large bottle, it'll engage output 27 which is the large fill solenoid if there's not a large bottle based on our boolean data our bit table if there's not a large bottle at that location 
and the filler is extended, it'll fire the small fill. So what's gonna get the filler extension to go back up? Well, if the filler is extended, filler extended limit switch, which is up here, it's LS4. If the filler is extended and either the large fill or the small fill uh, sensors, limit switch five and limit switch six. So when the solenoid goes all the way forward, this limit switch will go true. So if the filler is extended and the large or small has actually filled, done the filling operation, the limit switch will be made. So if either, either of those and that together will make our unlatch for our filler extension. So it's gonna be latched until the things that we need to happen are gonna happen, and then it's gonna automatically unlatch itself. And it's not gonna go back true, even if all this stuff before this one shot is still true, because it happens really fast. It's not gonna fire the extension to go back out again, because the one shot only goes when you've gone from a, a, a low to a high, you have to be on a rising edge. So even if this didn't change state and these two are still true, um, this extension is not going to just keep jumping in and out and in and out. I saw a lot of people with programs like that too, because this LS1 has to drop out or something else has to change. This one shot has to go low and then back high again to make it fire again. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. You'll see it when I run it here in a second. And then up here for the capper, this is a little bit easier. Same thing. I have a one shot uh, latching the capper to extend. And then when the extend limit switch, which is right here, it's purple right now, I mean, it's false or a zero. When this capper extends, that'll go green, signifying that that input has gone true. So when the capper extends fully, limit switch makes and it unlatches the capper, so the capper goes back up again. So it's the same thing. I have a one shot, so I need something to make this go low, because a lot of the time, there's not. this is detecting if there's a broken bottle here, because you don't want to fire, fire the capper if there's a broken bottle there. Um, both these bits are used to determine if that's a broken bottle or not. And if there's no broken, broken bottle, these are going to be true all the time. So this one shot will have only fired on the initial scan because everything preceding it will have been gone from false to true. And this will latch after the capper extends, this limit switch will make and it will unlatch the capper so it will go back up. Um, this one shot's never going to fire again though because these are going to stay true all the time. But if this LS1 back here, which is strobing for every single bottle, after that drops out, the one shot will go false. And then when it comes back on for the next bottle, as long as there's still no broken bottle there, it'll fire the one shot again and the capper will go back down again. So I'll uh, download this and run it quick. Let me see what I'm talking about. There we go. We had some old data in there, so it's acting kind of funny. So you can see I'm filling the right bottles, right size bottles with the right amount of fill there. And you can see these flashing. When they flash green, that means they went true. That means these, in this case, the filler extended fully and made the limit switch. And you'll see the capper will shoot down. So as soon as it shoots down and makes that green switch, it unlatches and shoots back up again. So it goes down really fast. So the only part that I had to add that's not in here is down where the conveyor runs, the main conveyor. So I added um, if the capper or the filler extender um, outputs are on, it stops the conveyor. So you see the conveyor is kind of jerking and it's not jerking because the box is full. That's the other thing that's down here. If this box is full and it has to index a new box in, it'll stop the top conveyor. Um, it's jerking because it stops every time this down solenoid gets energized or the capper solenoid down gets energized because obviously it needs to be still for the capper to go on and it needs to be still for the fill tube to go in. But I have it running pretty fast, so it's kind of hard to tell that that is happening. So I'll slow it down. You'll see the conveyor stops as it goes down and fills. Now when this is in position, it'll go down and fill and the capper goes down right about the same time. So it's nice that they're coordinated and they're both going up and down at the same time so your conveyor's not uh, slowing down any more than it needs to. But you'll see when this extends, as soon as the green makes, it unlatches. I can go back up and look at the logic. It's the capper extension. When this limit switch makes, it'll make the unlatch. It's this limit switch here is that limit switch right there. Six extends, unlatches, goes back up. Um, it's a lot more functional and makes more sense when you're trying to troubleshoot 
if you have things based off of events, if you have event-based programming versus timers, um, when timers are determining, this, this stuff can get all out of whack if there's timers that are, if you're basing everything on a, the amount of time that you think something takes to operate, because it might not take that long, it might be faster, it might be slower. Um, it's, it's just much better if you can say, and it's easier to troubleshoot too. So if you had everything based on timers, this would keep running and running and running. Whether or not it was actually doing what it was supposed to do, it would, it would still keep going. Um, at least in this case, you know that this is extending and you know that this solenoid is going out for the fill and then you know everything's going back the way it was supposed to. You know this capper is extending because the limit switch is making. So unless this thing's out of caps, um, you know for sure that it's going. If you just energized the solenoid for three seconds and then turned it back off, you don't you haven't really verified that it actually extended you're just saying that you turned on that output coming out of the plc for a certain amount of time in this case we know it extended because the limit switch doesn't make until it's all the way extended same with the fill tube extension if you just had it running for a certain amount of time you're not actually verifying with an input you're not getting feedback from the machine saying that it really did extend you're just sending power to the solenoid for a, cer for a certain amount of time um, like if a wire is broken to that solenoid the timer's still going to time that that output was on, but the solenoid is not going to do anything. You don't, you're not actually verifying that the solenoid moved at all. Um, same with these plungers for the fill, the large and small fill. If you use the limit switches, then you know that the plunger actually moved um, to where it's supposed to, to make that limit switch. If it was just on for a certain amount of time, you don't know that the plunger actually moved or not. It could be broken or jammed, or there could be a wire off of there. Uh, any number of things could be keeping it from actually going, but if you're verifying with the inputs that it actually made the limit switch, that, then you know for sure that it went. So that's one of the reasons that it's better to use event-based programming than timing, because um, you don't really have any feedback that something's broken. The timers are just going to keep running and running and running and doing whatever you set them up to do. So hopefully that clears some stuff up. We haven't really talked much. I'll probably talk in class tomorrow in person about latching and unlatching. Um, we talked a little bit about one shots but yeah other than these two sections right here and here and then putting um, the contacts in or the instructions in series with the top conveyor movement so that with this output energized or that output energized the top conveyor comes to a halt um, that's it for that section that's all I did hopefully that's helpful